Good morning. I'm Stéphane Barré, Head of Private Capital Group at Crédit Ecole CIB. And hey, morning everyone. I'm Craig Williams. I'm Head of Product for Private Equity and Real Estate Solutions at, uh, at Cassis. And we're here to tell you why we think that 2024 can be a fantastic vintage for all of us. But let's first dwell back to 2023. There's no doubt doing deals was extremely difficult. Why? There was a huge gap between valuations and price expectations from buyers and sellers. For one very simple reason is that historically we've been having cheap debt. We all know that. Attractive multiples, very high level of multiples. But in today's market where fundraising has been extremely difficult and ICs are requiring deals to be very good out of the box, the IC is expecting at a very attractive valuation, and if your price expectation is too high on the other side, you're not going to get the deal done. And so we've lived through an environment in which clearly a lot of the transactions where the, the, the number of, value of sponsors are out there trying to get the deal done, but the leverage is also very expensive. Cost of leveraging your deal has doubled from 5% to 10%. So if you combine all three elements, a tough IC, tough debt environments, and a huge price gap between buyers and sellers, it's been very difficult to do deals in 23. It clearly has been attractive for trade players who have been able to catch those attractive situations, but all in all, M&A is very low, debt deals are very low. Yeah, well, for me on the, um, the fund administrator and depot bank side, it's been actually a great year for 23. I mean, the big thing for us was obviously the acquisition, moving from RBC, Investor and Treasury Services, over to Cassis. Uh, basically, our business doubled so, you know, we, we moved to about, I think, 545 billion euros assets under depot. Um, we have about 300 billion assets under admin now. On the admin side, um, that's meaning we have 4,500 funds that we service, alternate investment funds and sub funds. Uh, there's a global workforce of about 750 people purely dedicated to private capital. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main focus for me was a lot of our, our roadmap our service offer and our, our rate cut, especially in the hybrid fund space. A lot of talk on hybrid funds. Um, what does it mean? You know, there's open-ended, um, open-ended sub funds with private assets. You've got public and private assets coming together in the same portfolios. Um, and it's really about, for me, it was decomplexifying that into what is a simple operating model, I'd say. It is true that 23 was a year of big mergers, big combinations, yes, obviously yours, RBC <laughs> and Cassis. But we've seen that across the industry in which players need now to diversify. The bigger, the better. LPs are concentrating their effort on key players. And if you're a key player, well, you have multiple services and products to offer. We've seen the CVC, DEEF transaction. We've seen Bridgepoint buy energy infrastructure partners. And lastly, but last this week, BlackRock buying GAP. So clearly there's a big concentration coming in the, in the industry. And so you have to be ready for 24. And that's why we think 24 is ripe for very good returns. Prices are coming down. Leverage is slightly increasing. Everybody's expecting 150 basis point decrease next year, at least in the US. How much is that going to be in Europe? We don't know, but we expect that there's going to be some significant spill-off and pressure on the ECB to not have the euro run too high up in terms of the exchange rate, and therefore rates will have to come down. If rates come down, and there, that means that risk is back on, well, maybe it could be a great year to start filling up your bag. If you listen to most American bankers, they will tell you that it's the time to go public, right? It's all these tech deals. Now it's the time to go public. Markets are going to open up. You're going to see 24 is going to be a fantastic year. But if you look at it in a bit more detail, in a bit more granular way, on the private equity side, as I mentioned earlier, LPs, fundraising has been difficult. We all know that across the industry. So what has been the impact? Those people that have done transactions have not been raising more funds. Those that have raised more funds have done a few transactions, but it means that the portfolios are very big, much bigger than they usually are. In a fund, you're going to have 10 to 15 deals per, de per, per year, per, per fund, sorry. And that means that any GP is going to have 20, 30 companies in their portfolio. Now, most of them, that same vintage will have 40, over 40 portfolios in their company. They're not built to manage that many companies, so they have to come down. LPs on the other side are putting pressure. If you don't start selling businesses, you're not going to see me next time you do a fundraise. So it's a clear message. You have to get out there. You have to sell. Okay. So how do you sell? How do you sell a good a business? How do you attract a valuation coming on the other side? Well, that means that you're going to have to sell quality assets, where even if you have bought at a high multiple, the EBITDA growth 
between the day of your acquisition and the day you're going to put it on the market has grown sufficiently so to make an adequate return even if there is a multiple compression. Those are the companies that people are going to be wanting to spend some time on, on the buy side and the sell side. And us as a bank, we're more than happy to finance good-looking companies that have attractive growth rates and attractive profitability. If you combine all that, it's going to start this cycle back again, giving money back to LPs and getting that virtuous cycle back into play again. That's how we see the private equity market, at least going forward. Craig, on yeah, your side? Yeah, I'd say in terms of, you know, how do you service those particular products For and sure. funds? Um, you know, LTIF 2.0 went live last week. Uh, it's all about, you know, I guess some mainstream or mainstream um, asset managers perhaps launching open-ended funds. We're seeing specialists in the closed-ended space having the open-ended funds. Um, there's a, probably a, a great increase in terms of the number of different players, fintechs and others, fund distribution platforms mm -hmm. touching into the um, retail space. How do you build an operating model onto the you know, fund administration? Depository side is actually going to be key. Um, all those tech solutions, I think, are, well, part of that revolution, I guess, in the uh, retailization um, of the market. And I guess in terms of other revolutions, um, in terms of AI, yep. Stefan, yep. what do you think? AI, mm, big question mark. But um, I say I was a bit sceptical myself. Everybody yeah. speaks about AI. We, it's a lot of money. Big sky idea, you know. Big, big tie idea. I think there were over 4,500 deals funded in AI oh, yeah. with over 50 million invested in each one of them. It's a lot of money pouring into a lot of companies. Of those 4,500, how many are going to survive? Maybe five. Mm. We all know that. Ooh, it's going to be costly <laughs> to the industry. But nevertheless, if there's a winner, you can play. You know? that's, the, that's the game here. Um, but the way I actually, one of the sponsors made me a presentation about AI. Yeah. And I must say I was pretty impressed. They looked at a company and they applied AI by looking at all the other data that they can get that we cannot get when we do our usual transaction. Mm -hmm. We do a vendor due diligence, finance, strategic, commercial, blah, 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 blah. And they said, that'll give you this result for this company. Actually, if you use AI, then you can start looking at to the people that the company has hired over the first five years, how much have they produced on the R&D side? Has their growth cycle in terms of tech grown or not? Has the quality of these people grown or not? What is their background? Mm. Have they been changing? Has there been more churn in the R&D people that you have bought, yeah. which is basically the engine of your future growth, yeah. and what you're actually buying is, is the pipeline? And they could actually come out and say that the people that the company has hired are poorer than they were in the beginning, mm. and therefore the forward-looking statements are going to be negative. And I was kind of saying, I would have never looked at the LinkedIn of all the guys the company hired no. for the past five years. You no, know, right. it's, it's impossible. But AI can do that for you. Mm. So I think it's going to bring big changes in the industry. How far? I don't know. But clearly, it's going to be a tool that we all need to incorporate in our thinking process, whether it be the banks, whether it be the sponsors. The, the entire industry is going to need to, to yep. work with AI, no doubt. Yeah, on I your mean, side, same thing, uh, no? Yeah, for us, it's just about relevance. So people, you know, when you make, say the big sky idea, what does it mean? Mm. So, you know, is it improving your onboarding process? Yeah. Due diligence, mm -hmm. corporate investor due diligence, um, invoice payments, you know, it's that sort of thing where that's AI. Yeah. Automating that, how that works, um, that, that will revolutionise things. Um, and then it's a BAU, I think, for everyone's roadmap. Mm. Um, and everyone wants to see what you can do. Yep. So you need to be ready to demonstrate it. Yeah. 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 Um, perhaps real estate? Private debt? Real estate, private debt. Uh, two different stories. The stories, <laughs> black and white, huh, clearly. Uh, on the real estate side, uh, it's tough. It's very tough out there. Uh, we've seen a lot of funds. By June, September, they were running below their hurdle rate in terms of returns. Some of them are running below par. Uh, so I think there's a very significant impact on real estate funds. Uh, but the flip coin of that is, if you're starting a real estate fund today, you're going to make a killing. Yep. You have to be patient. You have to be able to hold that position for the next two or three years, which is when the cycle is going to end up finding its, its bottom. But you're going to do great deals, great, uh, great opportunities. And so we think right now, real estate is the right time to jump in, but with no legacy. So if you've got legacy, you're going to have to manage it. Otherwise, it's a good story to talk about. So that, that's on real estate. But there's always real estate deals, and yeah. it goes as back as mankind, right? It's caveman. So we, yes. <laughs> um, private debt. Private debt is one of the fastest growing asset classes in the industry, clearly. Mm -hmm. If you're not in private debt, you're nowhere. So mm -hmm. clearly, it's a, it's a segment that everybody needs to tackle. And we've talked about consolidation earlier. 
I think that in 2024, you're going to see a lot more players coming into the debt market, the private debt market. If they don't have it already as a tool being offered to the LPs, they're going to buy a team or buy, uh, or buy a portfolio, buy a GP. Because it's an industry where size matters, yep. number one. You need to have multiple vintages to be able to take that opportunity. But, I mean, jumping into a debt fund today, at the interest rates that they are today with the low multiples, which are bound to come down, you're going to do a killing today. You're just yeah. going to do sweet money for the next two or three years in a private debt fund. That's number one. And number two, they clearly have shown in the past two years that they're here to stay. Yeah. Banks, like us, have been losing market share to private debt, to what we call unirate funds. They're nimbler, they're quicker, and they can respond to the needs of the sponsor you know, overnight practically. We have to find a mix, and how do we live with these debt funds? How do we provide a syndicated facility which includes key private debt players, but also the banks in the syndicated market? Yeah. So we have to find a way to, to live together. I think 24 will be the first vintage in which the two entities, the two groups will live together. That's, that's how we see things. Yeah, same for us. I mean, yeah. in terms of what the operating models we have, it's public and private loans in the same portfolio, mm. same sub fund. Um, as part of the big umbrellas and the part twos yep. in Luxembourg in particular, you know, an LTIF 2.0, um, you'll see a you know, private debt credit strategy could be the first sub fund. Mm -hmm. The second sub fund might be no for an asset class. And then another one might be something like infrastructure. Yeah. And thinking about infrastructure, where do you see the horizon? Inf infrastructure. I think infrastructure has been the safe haven well, over the past two years. We all know it's investment grade. We all know it's long statements, long transactions, long projects, which are needed for everybody around the table for energy transition, for telecom, mm -hmm. for digital, for all these items. Uh, and so clearly, I think the portfolios have been growing. Once again, the benefit was if you're buying a company in the infrastructure space 10, 15 years ago, the multiple was pretty attractive. Yeah. You're buying it now, the multiple is going to be less attractive, obviously. And so there is going to be an impact of the cost of interest on those multiples and on some of the latest transactions. And so the way we see infrastructure is, game is wide open. The issue is gonna be, however, giving money back. Yep. They also need to give some money back. Uh, just like venture, we're not gonna spend much time on venture, but uh, venture growth, they need to give some money back. They need to show that the investments they did in tech are gonna produce some kind of Do a return. Have. If it's meager, but they have to produce some kind of return. On the infrastructure space, I think the assets, the quality assets, are not going to get sold. No. That's my point of view. I think that they're going to be looking to sell stripes. Sell 10%, 15%, 20% of a company. That way they keep the, the good business going forward. Eventually it'll go from value add to core. But the idea is to find new pockets to give some liquidity, yet keep that asset, that long-term asset, for a long time. Because going out there and trying to get a new asset is always competitive. It's yeah. very difficult. So we think infrastructure is here to stay. Definitely, it's a great asset class. I think there's lots of opportunity. And um, we see more people coming in and more combinations with private equity, clearly. Yeah. Yeah, for us, I mean, just to touch on that, I guess it's the, the big global structures, um, often from an admin side, you've got like a global operating model Outsourcing can come into play. Yep. Got to be mindful of the regulation. There is an outsourcing um, circular in, in Lux Live this year. Um, that could change the dynamic mm -hmm. in terms of some asset managers maybe bringing some activity in house, or it could be other things like us where you look at US Cayman. Yep. Um, how can you service the fund? There's a big demand for full service um, global offerings. Yep. And so there could be a lot of partnerships and opportunity around that for this mm -hmm. year. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe just a couple other t key roadmap items sure. ESG, tokenization. Sure, sure. More Probably BAU, EA, ESG, in terms of... ESG, uh, it kind of goes with infrastructure in a yeah. way. You need to be there. You need to have it. it. It's a tool that is here to stay. I think you cannot disregard ESG. No. We all know that. So that's, I'm not going to dwell more with that. I think now the time has come when you actually need to take ESG into account in the way you do your investment and the way you propose your investment to the mm -hmm. market. Okay. Um, we've actually built a ESG advisory team right. to say, if you're going to put this company public... These are the key criteria that the investors are going to be looking for. Yeah. So if you're going to sell this company, even if it's not in the public markets, uh, this is how you should position your ESG. Mm. And this is the best way to value the effort that you've already done and how do you portray it into the future. So we really think that ESG, now you have to take it to 2.0. Now, it's really the time when it's not just having, we, we have to do ESG, it's that we're incorporating ESG in the way we work on exactly, a daily yeah. basis. And that's really where we see ESG coming forward. Yeah, yeah it's just part of the DNA of offering, really. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe on tokenization, I think more step-by-step, step, but um, it's really about probably minimum viable products, 
um, asset managers, service providers doing those use cases. Yep. Um, investment is required. People want to see it. Yep. Um, and then demonstrate sort of what you can do and where you're going, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps maybe wrapping things up. Sure. Stefan, for right. 2024, um, yeah, looking at time. That's right. Inbox awaits me. Um, just thinking through, I think for me, it's like investment for, it's the balance between optionality, Always. product optionality, Always. and then about um, sta standardization, I would say. You've got to find that right balance. Um, for us, especially the hybrid funds, I'd say it's, um, you know, finding the, the total end-to-end -end operating models where you've got distributors, asset managers, um, service providers coming together yeah. to ensure that what you produce, it's scalable. Uh, the cost of fees are effective, otherwise no money. Yep. Um, and perhaps most important, you've got to meet the um, you know, investor requirements um, and meet Absolutely. the regulatory compliance. Um, and for you, Stefan, given this year might be a vintage year, I think it's year of the dragon, maybe the that's wood right. dragon, that's, that's right. right. That's Olympic right. year. Yep. Olympics just down the road here. Oof. A few, few suburbs away. Time to do uh, teletravail uh, far exactly away from right. Paris, exactly I think. Uh, exactly it's going to be a bit right. complicated this year. But 24, I think, uh, is ripe to do a lot of transactions. We've had two years of drought. You know, the drought has to stop at one point in time. The, the bar is open, so I think there, I'm sure there's going to be some opportunities to, to, to work on. I think you have to be very careful. You have to choose those deals you want to work on and pass on everything else. Selectivity is going to be ever all the more increasing because if the seller is not finding his price, he's going to yank that transaction out of the market. Um, so I think focusing on those transactions that you want to do, quality transactions, forget everybody else for the moment. It's not the point. Uh, I think the point is to get back to work, back to doing deals, mm. back to raising funds, back to showing your teams that we are actually doing deals on the buy side and on the sell side, and that the system is back in work again. Uh, by that token, I also expect quite a bit of carry to come in. Right. So it's going to be money time for a few of you guys. But uh, make sure that you manage that well and you come to Crédit Ecole. We've got a great <laughs> private bank. We've got great finan financing funding. We've got a, set up, man. a great Classy. admin here. Classy. Even a world-class admin. So guys, <laughs> you have no excuse. Do not give us a call. We're looking forward to seeing you at IPEM. And can't we, wait. Can't wait. Great stand. Looking forward Thanks, to it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. See ya.